Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Virtual Night Sky. This is a program that is presented by the Community Outreach Group for the Arizona State University School of Earth and Space Exploration. Uh, many of you I know are followers, and so if you're joining us for the first time, uh, just be aware we do this every other Wednesday night. And so we'll be giving you at the end of the program sort of a little sampling of what we're going to talk about at future events. But welcome. And uh, this is a, a COVID uh, product because we can't be visiting the Marston Exploration Theater on campus these days. But this team, the people we're working with tonight, uh, we're all involved in having uh, public outreach about having people come visit about uh, about having programs uh, that uh, uh, explain the, the amazing work that the School of Earth and Space Exploration does. And this is our our way of doing this during the shutdown. And uh, so I like to think of it is we're sharing something together apart. Uh, we get to be in our own living rooms, but we're looking at things uh, that we all sort of have in common. And that's the night sky. And tonight, especially, we're dealing with the moon. Uh, it's a, going to be a full moon in a, about a day and a half, so it'll look really, really full tonight. I just was out there a second ago. I always do that. It's traditional. We'll look at the sky just before I go online, and the clouds have cleared over my house. It's a very beautiful, clear night, and the moon is stunning. The reason to focus on the moon tonight is this is the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 14 landing on the moon. So if you remember, uh, back in 19. 69, uh, Apollo 11 was the first of that program. And within about three and a half years, six missions landed on the moon. So we celebrated the 50th anniversary of 11, and now we're working through a series of 50th anniversaries going forward. So that's kind of fun. Let me introduce you to some of the people that are on board tonight. Uh, first of all, uh, the person, our coordinator, uh, I'm going to start calling her our producer. She is uh, 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 Kim Baptista. She is the webmaster for our uh, our program. She's the one that does the communicating. And if you have any issues and things like that, uh, you know, let her know. She's going to send a survey after the program also. So if there's something you want to See if there's something you'd like to know about and we can fit it into a program. We're absolutely going to do that. Uh, Meg Hufford is online. She is my colleague. Between Meg and I, we are the ones that kind of uh, meet and greet most of the visitors to the campus uh, that come to our, our particular programs. And so this is what we're doing with our time these days. As soon as COVID's over, we'll be back on campus and ready to have you back again. Uh, we have three students that have been working with us through this whole program. We've been doing this now for about, I guess, nine or 10 months. Uh, so I'm going to introduce Alicia Hyatt. Uh, she's on board. Uh, uh, I'm going to introduce Alex Blanche. Uh, he has been here a little bit. And uh, Spurti Katre. She is. Uh, she had the week off last week or two weeks ago, so she's back with us today. And what they do is they, they work the questions in the background. So you can't chat with us, but you can go to the question and answer section of your program, of your, uh, of your Zoom, and just put in something. And if you're a student, especially if you're a K-12 student, we don't need to know a lot about you. But if you could just say your first name and what grade you're in, and if you want to sort of start your question that way, I'm so and so, and I'm in grade whatever, and uh, and ask your question, uh, we'll sort of like make sure sort of we call that out uh, uh, as we get to the questions as, if we can. And so the students are working in the background doing that. Tonight is really a special evening uh, to celebrate the Apollo 14, but it's also special for me because I get to turn over the microphone uh, to a team of young students that have just we've been working with them and talking about this program for a couple of days. And and uh, I just think they're amazing. And I think you're going to think so too. So let me introduce to you. I'm going to sort of read some bios here real quick. Uh, uh, <clears throat> first is uh, Jack Schulte. He's a senior. Uh, at ASU. He's studying physics with a minor in astrophysics. Uh, he's going to graduate in May and produce a P or pr uh, pursue a PhD in astronomy and uh, astrophysics somewhere else. Jack has been working at LROC. This is the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiting Camera. Uh, and so that's a center on campus. And you're going to hear a lot more about it. So whenever we say the acronym LROC, we're talking about a center that deals with a camera or set of a suite of cameras on a spacecraft that's orbiting the moon right now. So that's what LROC is about. Uh, uh, he's been working there since uh, 2019, about a year and a half, and he's uh, what they're doing is mapping a EVA. EVA is an extravehicular uh, activity on the moon. That's the moonwalks when the astronauts go out there. 
here. And so you'll see how that works. He's uh, worked on both Apollo 12 and Apollo 14 and sort of like recapping this stuff. And he does research in core collapse of supernova and uh, pre-solar stardust grains uh, with uh, another professor at CC named Mahatra Bose. And so uh, they, uh, she runs a program called the Iso uh, Center for Isotope Analysis. Um, he's an amateur astronomer and loves taking a look at the moon and planets and stars. And I know many people that are our followers are also amateur astronomers. So, uh, so Jack is, uh, is in good company. Uh, Nicole Gonzalez, she is the second of the students working with El Rock. And she started at El Rock as an undergrad and then she worked for El Rock for a period of time. And then she's rejoined them or joined them still as a PhD candidate. So she's working her way into, uh, into a PhD, uh, working in the, in the lunar geology at El Rock. And Nicole's work uh, focuses primarily on the uh, Apollo missions. That's why she's appropriate for tonight, for sure. And she's looking at uh, sample photos and equipment and video footage and uh, transcripts and all manner of archives that go with the Apollo missions and matching them and marrying them to the, the amazing digital photography and the work that comes from the LRO spacecraft. So without any further uh, introduction than that, I'm going to turn the microphone and the program over to Jack and to Nicole and uh, enjoy this. It's just going to be amazing. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you so much, Rick, for those great introductions. All right, uh, Jack's going to start sharing his screen. There we go. Um, so as Rick mentioned, uh, my name is Nicole. I'm a PhD student working at LROC. Um, and I am actually so much of an Apollo nerd that I ended up naming my cat Apollo as well. So I thought I'd feature him on the slide today. Uh, what better time, right? Uh, but I, as he mentioned, most of my work focuses on the Apollo missions, kind of recreating every step, uh, trying to follow them through their missions and see what they were doing when. And um, Jack, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, I'm really glad to have everyone out here tonight while we explore Apollo 14. Um, the 50th anniversary is actually not today, but it is on February 5th. And before we go straight into Apollo and explore the moon, why don't I tell you a little bit about what uh, we do here at the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera. So on your screen, I've shown uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which houses the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera, or LROC for short, uh, which is a three camera suite on board right about here. Um, it includes two narrow angle cameras and one wide angle camera that uh, Nicole will tell you a little bit more about as we explore the moon. Um, LROC has been going on for about 12 years, 12 years in June. And while we've, uh, while we've stayed in orbit, stayed strong, we've done uh, plenty of science along the way. And we are still doing science today, uh, both with our domestic and international uh, collaborations. So um, here in the United States, we've collaborated with the NASA Commercial, Land Commercial Landed uh, Apologies. Commercial, commercial Lunar Payload Services. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. It's actually Commercial Landed Payload Services. That's that's a tough one to wrap to wrap our minds around. <laughs> um, and uh, Artemis, which is the next uh, crewed mission to the moon, actually, it'll be the first woman and next man to land on the lunar surface. So we've done imaging and data products for them. And uh, in addition, we've worked with the planned uh, Intrepid mission, which will be a rover mission led by the principal investigator of uh, LROC, Mark Robinson. And so we've done some uh, kind of hazard avoidance uh, for them, and we've taken plenty of photos along that planned traverse. And then in terms of international collaborations, we've worked with the Japanese Space Agency, um, the European Space Agency, uh, the Indian Space Agency, Russia and Israel. Um, then last but not least, we do take a lot of photos of the moon, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, and of, uh, of those photos, some of, the mo some of the more interesting ones are ones, of, uh, ones like the ones that you can see in the bottom right hand side of the screen here. Uh, this is the, the before and after image of a landed uh, lunar lander. This is U22. Um, we've also taken plenty of photos of both natural impacts, so new craters forming on the moon, and artificial impacts, crash landers. So next, I'll give you back over to Nicole, 
who will take you through something that you can actually do on your own um, through this website right here. But she's going to give you a quick tour of the moon and the Apollo landing sites. Thank you, Jack. I will share my screen here really quick. Alrighty, so you guys should be able to see the moon here. Um, this is a software that uh, is run by Elrock. It's called Quick Map, and it's done completely online, so you don't have to download anything. And it's uh, made using images taken by Elrock over our almost 12 years now in orbit. Uh, it's constantly being updated with new images uh, from different angles, different sun angles. Uh, you name it, we we can update it with it. Um, it's a fun way for not only scientists, but also amateurs, people who are just interested in kind of exploring the moon a little bit, seeing what's there to take a look around. But it's also a handy tool for scientists, as you can see all these uh, cool layers that we've got over here that you can add in, look at the moon in different wavelengths, uh, look at it with to try and find different minerals. Uh, it's, it's a really handy tool uh, and a kind of a fun way to take our new images of the moon and to look at some uh, interesting science, but also what we're going to use it for today is to look at an important piece of history that many of you probably remember, actually. Um, so just to take a look at the moon here real quick, what we've got in yellow heading around is that is where the spacecraft is currently orbiting. It's that red dot back there heading around this way, coming up and then back around. Uh, and that, um, oops, let me pause this for a second. Okay, so that's our current location in orbit at the moment. What we are looking at is our view from Earth of the moon. Now we always see the same side of the moon and we call this the near side for that reason. Uh, whatever, wherever you come from, you can you often see different shapes in the moon. A lot of people will call it uh, out here. The most common one is the man in the moon, but I've also heard people call it the rabbit in the moon or the soccer player in the moon. And what you're describing with those is uh, these dark patches on the moon here and how they kind of stand out compared to the light patches and what shapes they they uh, show up to you. Um, and all that is what we well here hold on one second. Okay. So that those shapes are made by distinct coloring of the moon's surface and those dark spots uh, are named mare and that's Latin for seas and that's because hundreds of years ago people used to actually think that those were oceans and while we know today that they actually aren't they weren't completely wrong on earth uh the oceans form in basins kind of the lowest areas uh, of the planet that's where the water collects and these are actually the lowest spots on the moon uh the the dark spots are and that's what we call the mare those are about two to 3.8 billion year old basalts, while the light colored stuff that we see here, those are anorthites, about 4.4 billion years old. Uh, but the dark stuff is really kind of interesting because it has a significantly stronger gravitational pull than the rest of the um, lighter colored material. So much so that we actually call them mass cons, which is short for mass concentrations. Uh, and it was strong enough that actually during the Apollo missions, they took three men to the moon, but only two would descend to the surface so that one would remain in orbit in a lunar capsule to make sure that when the two wanted to head back to Earth, the uh, spacecraft that they met up with would be in the right spot at the right time and could actually bring them back. Alrighty, so. Oh, and I should also note, so this is the near side of the moon. The other side we call the far side, uh, but a lot of people will often mistakenly call it the dark side of the moon, though it is not always dark. For example, during a new moon, the near side of the moon is the side that goes dark, but the far side of the moon is actually lit. Uh, and a lot of people will get that name from a Pink Floyd album uh, called The Dark Side of the Moon, which is a great name for an album, but unfortunately it is not scientifically correct. But don't worry, I'm not pointing fingers. I love Pink Floyd. Alrighty, so what you see here are the six dots on my screen. You know what, let me turn off the spacecraft here for a second and reset the screen a little bit. There we go. So these six dots on the moon are the Apollo lunar landing sites. Uh, now, let's see, 
We've got 11 over here in Mare Tranquillitatis, this kidney bean shaped one. 12 is over here on the left. 14 is right next to it. 15 up at the top. 16 in the lighter colored material and 17 on the right over there. You'll notice I skipped 13. Many of you are probably familiar with why, but if you're not, go watch the Tom Hanks movie, Apollo 13. It's a good watch, I promise. Um, yeah, but today we are gonna explore Apollo 14. So let me drop into the site right here. We'll zoom in real quick and kind of take a look around. All right, so this is the Apollo 14 landing site. The uh, lunar module that they brought down is actually right here next to these triple craters, which they creatively named triplet craters. And over here on the right, we see what is called Cone Crater. And there's this other little pair of craters over here that is kind of where they, uh, they ventured over this way and kind of out that way. So I'll give you a better description of it here in a second. Let me pause this. Alrighty, so the men that went on this mission on Apollo 14 were Commander Alan Shepard right here in the middle, Lunar Module Pilot Edward Mitchell, and uh, Command Module Pilot Stuart Rusa. He was the one who would remain in orbit while Alan Shepard and Ed Mitchell went down to the surface. Uh, Alan Shepard, you'll recognize the name because he is famous for being the very first American in space in May of 1961. Uh, and this was actually only his second flight ever. This is Apollo 14. They landed once again on February 5th of 1971, so nearly 10 years after Shepard first flew. And uh, while on the surface, they would spend two days there, during which time they exited the spacecraft twice. And those excursions, as Rick mentioned, were called extravehicular activity, which we shortened to EVA. Pause this. One of the cool things, let's see if start sharing again, there we go. If you take a look at some of our LROC imagery, so this is one of our high res photos and we're gonna zoom in here to the landing site a little bit. And what you can actually see is part of their spacecraft right there. Let me show you a better view of that. So the Apollo missions took this spacecraft with them and we've got the command and service module over here. This is the part that would remain in orbit. And on the right, this is the lunar module. This is what went down to the surface, the surface. But few people are actually aware that this actually comes apart into two halves. So they would take the whole thing down to the surface. And this bottom piece right here is filled with a bunch of equipment, uh, the landing legs so that they could sit nicely on the surface. It's got the ladder where they would descend to the surface tools, um, empty fuel tanks from when they descended, and all that sort of stuff is stored in this bottom piece. But when you're leaving the room, the moon, especially when you're bringing with you a couple hundred pounds of moon rocks, you don't want all this empty weight to come with you. So this part would actually remain on the moon, and we can see it there to this day. And this part would head back up into orbit and meet up with the command and service module again, and they'd head back to Earth. But this descent stage right here, we can see in our LROC imagery, I'll bring you back to quick map right here. And that's what this little light speck is here with the shadow going off to the left. You can see it a little bit better if I change, here's a better view of it. There's the lunar module and there, these lines are actually their footprints. So while you walk around on the moon, uh, it's kind of a soft material and you can kick it up pretty easily with your feet and that'll leave this nice beautiful trail behind you and since the uh, moon doesn't really have an appreciable atmosphere and there's no water there's nothing like that really kind of going on the footprints that you leave behind stay there so we can see them to this day 50 years after they landed uh, so i'm going to go ahead and pass it off to jack here so that he can give you a tour of the very first extravehicular activity uh, while they were on the moon Thank you, Nicole. And so first I'm going to take you to another uh, another thing that you can follow along. Sorry, that is my desktop, not what 
you want to be looking at. Uh, but here is the website that I'm going to be exploring next. Uh, this is on LROX, uh, on LROX website, and we're just going to take a better look at the landing site through this link. So uh, just so that you know where to find it, if you go to the LROC website and you hit images and then go to featured sites and then Apollo landing sites, you'll get to where we are right here. So this is a little bit dark, but this is the Apollo 14 landing site. You can see in the center there, that's the lunar module. And let's just make that a little bit easier to see. So by scrolling here, you can change the sun angle and at different sun angles, particularly those where the sun is highest in the sky, you can really see those tracks left by the astronauts. That's both footprints and uh, the tracks from them pulling equipment on the surface. And then in some of these, uh, in some of these images, you can really see the reflection off of equipment on the left-hand side here. That's part of the Apollo uh, Lunar Surface Experiments Package, or ALSEP for short. Um, you can also see even the cables. They use these really kind of these fat but flat um, cables to connect uh, the different pieces of equipment, the different experiments to the central station, which is right here. Um, and then last but not least, you can also see little pieces of foil that were ejected from the ascent stage of the lunar module as the, uh, as the ascent stage took off with the astronauts to come back home to Earth. So we'll just kind of finish the circuit here, show the rest of the sun angles. Perfect, and you can really see that long shadow that's being cast by the lunar module there, by the descent stage of the lunar module. And next we'll take a look, a more detailed look at the site. So this, uh, so this is, once again, the Apollo 14 landing site. You can see the lunar module right here. And uh, during, the first, during the first few moments of the Apollo 14 EVA-1, uh, one of the first things that they did, they did this actually in all of the missions, was they deployed the flag. Uh, so in Apollo 11, I'm sure that some of you have seen uh, photos or video of them deploying the um, the American flag, we love to kind of tag tag the moon as our own. Um, but we did that in each in each of the missions. So first I'll just show you a couple photos and videos of the flag deployment. Um, all of these photos are Hasselblad photos that were taken from the moon and you can find them online at the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal. So on the left-hand side here is Commander Alan Shepard. You can see he has these red bands on his, uh, on his astronaut suit there. Um, and this is actually the first mission where they use those red bands to distinguish between the two astronauts, which is helpful for us as, um, as archivists going back and looking at this. But it's also really helpful um, for, the, for Houston back down on the ground uh, to just be able to tell the difference between the two astronauts because it's really hard um, in these low resolution uh, TV cameras that you'll see in just a moment here. And I think actually uh, one moment here, let me just reshare this so that I can make sure that you guys can hear it. Oh, I did it right the first time. I'm just double checking myself. Okay. The flag being positioned about 20 feet from Antares. So on the right-hand side is the data acquisition no, camera. Okay. On the left-hand side oh, yeah, is the, good side. the um, Houston could see on the ground while they were doing this. The data acquisition camera was brought back to them, uh, brought brought back to Earth by the astronauts. And you can see lunar module pilot Ed Mitchell is uh, hammering in the bottom half of the flag staff into the into okay. the lunar surface. So that, Al Shepard can go ahead and put the top half. Yeah, you're going off camera to the right. And you'll notice the quality difference between those two images. On the right hand side, you have a film camera. The film was developed after it was returned to Earth. And on the left hand side, in that field of view, you can actually see that big giant dish is what is transmitting that TV signal back to Earth for Houston to see it. 
Thank you, thank you, Nicole. The flag oh, being whoops. Let's just go ahead and skip that. And so this is what the lunar module looked like after they had deployed the flag. Um, this is the descent stage that Nicole was talking about and the ascent stage, which they took off from the moon with. And then on the lower left-hand side, you can see this is the LR cubed or the laser ranging retro reflector. It's kind of a mouthful, but uh, this is the only piece of Apollo equipment that can still be used um, for science today. And what we do is we actually shoot a laser from Earth uh, to that uh, LR cubed, and then do, uh, we measure the transit time of the laser between the Earth and the moon, and we can determine exactly the distance between the Earth and the moon. So let me take you back to our map here. And so after deploying the flag and uh, removing the ALSEP equipment, they proceeded to traverse along to the northwest here. I'm going to illuminate a few lines. These, uh, these lines signify where they walked on the moon. The red is uh, Commander Al Shepard and the blue is Ed Mitchell. Um, and so you can see they walked out to the northwest here about 180 meters, I think uh, between 175 and 180 meters um, out to the ALSEP deployment site, which I'm just gonna declutter a little bit here. And one of, uh, well, one of the pieces of equipment that took the longest time to set up was the active seismic experiment or the ASE, uh, which you can see here is a, um, is a group of three geophones and a mortar package here, which I'll show you a picture of in, in a few moments here. Um, and you may not notice this, but they actually brought explosives to the moon. Uh, the lunar module pilot, Ed Mitchell, actually went along this line here and deployed 22 small explosives uh, to test um, some of the lunar, uh, the internal properties of the moon. And uh, then the active seismic experiment up here was supposed to launch a series of larger um, charges, but they didn't end up using it in Apollo 14 um, for fear of damaging the equipment. And so I'm just going to switch back over to our Hasselblad photos here. And what you can see here are the tracks made by a sort of wheelbarrow type device that they use to get some of their equipment out to the ALSEP site. It's called the Modular Equipment Transporter. And you can see just how well uh, this has been illuminated um, by the sun here. Uh, this kind of um, surf, this, this uh, topsoil that has been turned over. And you can see the lunar module there in the background. And then once they got out to the site, this is what it looked like after they had finished deploying it, of course. Um, in the center here is the central station. This is what they connected everything to, and it housed the switches where they turned everything on and were able to relay that information back to Earth with this antenna. And then here's that active seismic experiment mortar package that I told you about, and the first of the geophone lines. Um, off to the right is the radioisotope thermoelectric generator. Um, this is what they use to power all of the equipment, and you may know what this is if you've seen The Martian, actually. Um, this is the um, little box of plutonium that Mark Watney was not supposed to dig up, yet he did anyways. <laughs> um, and then in the background here, we can see the passive seismic experiment. This was just used to measure both um, natural and artificial moonquakes on the Earth, or on, on the moon, sorry. Um, and those artificial moonquakes are created by the astronauts walking around there. Um, we often use the PSC data actually to um, more accurately time events in our, in our spatiotemporal maps. Um, so that's just a fun use that we got out of it, but there's been plenty of science that was done with it as well. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that image in just a moment here. Afterwards, they, after they had finished setting up the ALSEP um, experiments, they went all the way back to the lunar module. But on the way, they collected a couple of samples 
first, the comprehensive sample, and second, the football size rock samples um, before getting back to the lunar module, closing out, and then sleeping off a hard day's work. But um, that football size rock, they did some special training back on, uh, back on Earth for. This is uh, back at Cape Canaveral, Florida. You can see that they didn't actually train with a football sized rock, they trained with a youth sized football. And in the foreground, you can actually see an armadillo, which is not a native species to Florida. It's an invasive species, but this is just a fun little photo that we, that we have from the Apollo 14 training. So next, I'm going to flip you back over to Nicole, who's going to tell you all about their geologic traverse in EVA2. Thank you, Jack. I will go ahead and share my screen here again. All right. So once again, drop you right back into the Apollo 14 site. This is Cone Crater over here, just a quick review. And these three craters on the bottom, they called Triplet Crater, which is right next to the lunar module right here. And these dots that you are seeing, those are the uh, places where they plan to stop to kind of do some experiments, take some samples, and find out a little bit more about the area where they were. As Jack mentioned, this was their geologic traverse. Uh, so they'd finished setting up the equipment, and now it was kind of just about learning what was out there, looking at cool rocks, and bringing, finding stuff to bring home. And I'm going to just drop you into the site here. This is a 3D view, so I'm going to kind of rearrange it and show you what it would look like if we were kind of hovering over the lunar module which is again right here in the foreground, looking out towards Cone Crater. So this is where they headed out for EVA2. And on the NASA images that they used to plan this mission, they actually thought that this area was pretty flat. But now that we're in this 3D view, you can kind of see that it really wasn't. There's a little bit of a depression over here where the lunar module is sitting, a hill that rises, drops into a valley, and then rises into another hill over here. And that kind of rolling hills kind of terrain is what we geologists like to call hummocky terrain. Um, and it was significant here in particular because on this mission, this was the last one that they did as uh, a traverse that was entirely on foot. On later missions, they would bring a little lunar buggy with them called the rover or grover. Um, but on this one, they were walking, which is why they had the mobile equipment transporter that Jack mentioned, just kind of like a little wheelbarrow to carry their tools and samples. Um, but they would also, for this one, they had a TV camera that wasn't portable yet. The later missions would have a portable camera on the rover, but this one did not because uh, they didn't want to carry it by hand and would have required uh, a lot of delicate calibration to get it to work right. So their TV camera was actually sitting over here with the lunar module, uh, was wired directly into the lunar module with a cable that didn't lie flat, even though they thought it would. Uh, but it pointed out towards Cone Crater in this kind of direction, general direction right there. And uh, Houston had hoped to be able to watch the astronauts for most of this traverse, only to find them disappear over the horizon quite early on in uh, that EVA. And I'll show you what I mean by disappearing over the horizon here in a second. So the astronauts were kind of on their own while they were doing this traverse, but they still were able to bring back some pretty incredible samples and some beautiful photos. Let me pause this and switch you over to some of the photos here. All right, so this is at one of those first stops along the traverse. Uh, they paused here. You can see the lunar module in the distance and these beautiful tracks that bring you all the way out to where they are currently standing. This is the mobile equipment transporter that Jack talked about. And here you can tell by the red stripe on his helmet that this is Commander Alan Shepard setting up some tools right here. It's a pretty beautiful area out here that they landed in. And you can still see where they came from. But just a few stops later, this is uh, station B1, so two stops later, if you take a look at that horizon, you'll notice that there is no more sign of the lunar module. Fortunately, you can't get really get lost on the moon because all you have to do is follow your footprints back to where you came from. Since on the moon, there is no appreciable atmosphere, nothing happens to those footprints. You can just follow your own trail back to where you came from. It's kind of handy. On this particular photo, what we're looking at here is we've got the uh, lunar module pilot, Ed Mitchell. You can tell because there are no stripes on his sleeve here. 
and he is looking at his map to make sure he's got the right location and that they are sampling in the area where they intended to. I mentioned earlier that uh, NASA thought that this area was pretty flat. So let's take a look at that map that Ed's got in his hand right there, and I'll show you why. So this is a scan of the map that Ed was carrying in that photo, Ed Mitchell. And uh, this is where they planned to go on that traverse. They wanted to come out this way. You can tell, well, the letters are in alphabetical order. They're hard to see here, but there's a few different stations where they would stop along the way. The lunar module did land in exactly the right spot over here on the left next to these triplet craters. And there's Cone, the final destination over here on the right. But on the way out to Cone, you can tell how in this image, this area looks actually pretty flat. And, but it has these odd stripes kind of going through the frame here. And the reason for that is actually because of the way that they had taken these photos using an orbiter. Now in these days, you know, we're used to orbiters that like LROC just take digital photographs of the surface, but that wasn't really an option back then. They wouldn't have gotten a uh, high enough quality. So what they did instead was they sent up an orbiter it was taking pictures with film. So that's what these stripes here are. It is, a, uh, it would take it, point itself down at the moon and take a continuous photo on film of the moon. But instead of sending that back to earth to get processed, which would have taken a lot more extra fuel and, and um, a, a lot of extra resources. Instead, that orbiter processed the film entirely on board while orbiting, scanned the film and transmitted that back to earth. And they would use that film to create these images of the Apollo landing sites and to kind of plan where they wanted to go. So unfortunately, the sun wasn't at a good angle to show them how hummocky this terrain is or if it, that it had rolling hills in the area. So they were kind of just left with this to base uh, their analysis off of. And because of that, they actually had a rather difficult time finding the rim of Cone Crater up here. Even though it looks very prominent in this image, they did a few stops kind of right in this area uh, they did two stops there to kind of take a look around and let's take a look at those next. So the rim of Cone Crater is actually in this panorama. This is one of those stations right close to uh, Cone Crater, as I mentioned. And uh, in this particular one, you'll notice it doesn't look all that hilly, but it is still kind of hard to see where anything is. And once again, the rim of Cone Crater is in this picture. They could tell that they were close to it because you can see there's a lot of big boulders here, which suggests they are close to the site of an impact. Um, but I actually had a really difficult time finding the rim in this picture until I had to, I had to go look up where it is. It's actually right there. Um, yeah, so you can tell how easily they, they got lost out there from that. I'm going to pause this here for a second. Yeah. So that was kind of their, uh, the big events of their second traverse. Uh, when they got back to the lunar module, Alan Shepard was a big fan of the game golf. And so he decided to actually bring with him half a golf club that he would attach to a uh, tool handle extension, that they, one of their tools that they brought with them and he would play some golf on the moon. So you know what, let me stop sharing here for a second just to make sure I've shared this correctly. Oops. I did, but we're just gonna do this again anyway. All right, and we'll take a look at what it was like to golf on the moon. Uh, Houston, while you're looking that up, you might recognize what I have in my hand is the uh for the contingency sample return. It just still happens to have a genuine six iron on the bottom of it. In my left hand, I have a little white pellet that's from me in a million dollars. Is that audio coming through okay there, Jack? I'm going to drop it down. Unfortunately, the is so stiff, I can't do it with two hands, but I'm going to try a little sand trap shot here. Thanks.
Alrighty, so there you have Shepard really enjoying his time on the moon. Um, let me switch this really quick. And while you're switching over, an interesting thing to note is you probably noticed that he was only swinging it with one hand. That was because of the limitations of the suits that they were working with. They were very difficult. You actually couldn't even bend those suits at the waist. So you couldn't really get a true golf swing down, down there. That's right. It's hard to move around when you're in a rubber balloon, believe it or not. Whoops. Uh, yes, sir, Lonnie, you're looking at up to you, man. There we go. All right. And that was kind of the end of their uh, fun times on the moon. Um, but on their way out, we're going to show you a video of what it looks like to take off in the ascent module, which once again is this top half of the spacecraft. And you'll be able to see the descent module that they left behind and a few of their tracks, as well as the flag. Keep an eye on the flag while uh, we play this video real quick. Two, one, so there's the flag right there. It's descent module in the corner. And these are their footprints, the tracks that they left across the surface as they take off. Um, and that is the story of Apollo 14. So glad you could share it with us. And uh, yeah, you you guys are absolutely amazing. That was something I can't. So I'm just, I'm a little bit choked up because I'm old enough uh, to uh, remember these missions. I mean, I was about uh, 10 years old, I think, when Apollo 11 hit the surface. And I remember watching it. I remember the living room floor at my mom and dad's house and the old big, huge Zenith console TV that I watched that on. And then <clears throat> I followed these. I followed every one of them, every launch, every landing uh, as much as I could as a 10 and 12 year old. So that was uh, absolutely amazing. So now you guys are younger than me. And you're going back and just kind of like like relooking, reliving, and putting all the archives together. Um, I just think it's amazing. Do you feel like archaeologist, or do you feel like um, um, you're doing? I mean, you're doing something special. But do you know how special that is? I mean, do you kind of have that sense when you go to work? It's a pretty incredible thing. Yeah, it does kind of make you feel a little bit like Indiana Jones, you know, getting to go back and recreate everything step by step. Although, unfortunately, we don't get to go there as cool as that would be. But we do have these incredible images. And uh, we've been trying to kind of piece the everything back together in more detail than has done before. So for example, um, the way we've been mapping it is we're kind of trying to track at each point in time, where are the astronauts? Not only are they sampling, but are they going to pick up a piece of equipment? Um, so that way we can kind of get it in more detail and, and uh, find all the points more accurately and, and really try to remember these uh, the way that they were. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, yeah, I'm just going to say many of them, many of these astronauts are also still alive. So have you had a chance to meet some of them? Have you ever had a chance to sort of like talk, you know, some of the things that you have or questions about what you might have found or? I wish. Um, the PI of our project has uh, had a little bit of correspondence with a few of them and uh, a few of the wives of those who've passed on since. Yeah. Um, I A long time ago, I was able to meet uh, Jim Lovell at a high school event, but I had no idea that I was going to end up working on these. So to <laughs> be able to in, come back and, and yeah, it was, it was pretty it incredible. Did you a little bit? So when, yes, yeah, so oh, cool. when did you decide you were a moon, a moon person? When did you decide? Uh, probably in high school, I think. Okay. Um, so right about the time I had met Jim Lovell, I'd learned the story of the Apollo missions and it just, it captured me. You know, it was this incredible story, this incredible journey. And uh, I, I wanted to be just like them. I mean, who wouldn't, right? How Jack, about you, Jack? I'm going to ask the same, I'm saying, I'm saying the same question of you and then we'll go to some audience questions. So, so when did you get uh, excited about lunar research? What happened? Well, um, I, I'd have to say that I, I've always been interested in space research. It, it probably wasn't until I watched um, the Apollo 13 movie um, way back. I, I can't remember when that came out, but I watched it soon after it came out that I, that I really found that that kind of stuff is really interesting. And then uh, the Apollo 11 movie, if anyone else has uh, seen it, was just the icing on the cake. And once I got to uh, start to work on this project, it was just, um, it's, it's truly incredible to kind of go back through um, each, each of these astronauts experiences on the moon. You really kind of get to experience it with them as you're watching these tapes, listening to what they're saying. You of course know, know each of their backgrounds. 
and you hear all of these fun stories, um, particularly Apollo 12. If um, any of you guys have the chance to kind of look up the story of the Apollo 12 astronauts, uh, they they were quite quite the crew. They were pretty a pretty fun bunch together. It's really cool we'll... to be able to go back and pull out some of these stories, you know, that have kind of been lost to time. I mean, mm -hmm. they're still there, but like most people haven't heard of them. So being able to bring them to light again is, is no, really and, cool. It, and for me, old enough to have sort of lived it the first time, I forgot everything I learned. So uh, so this is a good thing. Uh, you mentioned Mark Robinson is the uh, is the director and the, the principal investigator on L Rock. Uh, he also recommends a book. I happen to have it here. So if anybody does want to, uh, this is one he just, he says, of the books, if you want to know about this and the history and all of that stuff. So this is Andrew Chaikin, and it's uh, A Man on the Moon is, uh, is one that comes highly recommended for those that want to follow up. So. So that, that is one we always start our training with when working on these Apollo it missions. Isn't, so, you, so he got yeah. you too. My okay. copy, my copy <laughs> is somewhere back there. <laughs> I'm going oh, yeah, to, so right I'm going to, we're going to sort of with time, I, I'm going to move along and let Alex, Alicia and Sperti come into, uh, into the share the screens. And we've got a little poll question for the audience and maybe some questions uh, that have come from the audience that, that go to you guys. So hang around for just a second here. Awesome. Thank you so much to uh, our wonderful guests tonight. Um, what I'm going to do now is go ahead and launch our first poll. So that should be launched. Our first question says, how long has Elrock been taking photos of the moon? 20 years, 10 years, three years, or six months? So go ahead and think back to what our presenters mentioned and cast your votes. And while we're waiting for this, I'm gonna go ahead and have Alex and Spoo take a question or two. All right, thank you, Alicia. Um, so Michelle says, great presentation and why did they select that location to land and collect samples and data? Got to unmute first. All right, that's a great question. Uh, now this particular site was one of the first times that they ventured off. You'll remember I showed the, the pictures of the, uh, the dark spots on the moon and kind of where the Apollo landing sites were. Um, this is one of the first times that they actually decided to venture off of those darker spots and kind of head towards that uh, a little bit more difficult terrain to land in, the, the lighter colored material. Um, and this particular site, they were really interested in Cone Crater because it uh, excavated material a little bit deeper and would give them a better insight into the surrounding area and the different layers that uh, made up the area and kind of the history and they'd be able to piece back together um, the order of events uh, out there. Yeah, and this uh, this particular site actually that they landed at for Apollo 14 was the target site for Apollo 13. But since Apollo 13 wasn't able to land, oh. they decided to transition it back to Apollo 14 and they got the chance. The area is called the Framoro Highlands. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, poll results? Yes, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, speaking of sharing, I'm going to share our results for that poll question. Uh, and 53% of us got it right, so a majority of us. Uh, and yes, it has been 10 years of uh, taking photos. So we're really excited. And you're able to look at those on our website uh, or on LROC's website, which Kim, uh, I believe, posted in the chat. So thank you so much. And Rick, we're going to pass it off to you. Oh, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to try a little tricky share here. Thank you guys very much and hang out until the end of the show, please. And uh, we might have another chance to recoup, but uh, I'm going to change gears just a little bit. I'm going to talk to you a little about another uh, another lunar adventure. And so um, this is going to take just a second to call this up. I think I can do this really quickly. I get to do that share screen. I get to optimize and... Uh, I'm going to show you something. Okay. Um, I don't know if you recognize this guy, but this is, this is me and I'm uh, actually outside the building. So uh, what I wanted to show you is, uh, is actually something going on uh, another lunar mission and uh, we're building a little spacecraft inside our building at ASU. And this gives me a chance to just kind of show you around a little bit. So I'm going to talk you through this. So let's see where we go. Uh, we're sort of outside. Uh, this is the Eastern side of campus. The building's called ISTB4. There's a special name. It's about seven stories tall. And what's really cool about it is that the first two floors are public access. We sort of think of it as the pivot point between research 
research that we do there and a place that uh, public can engage and just sort of see what's going on. So you see there's a there's a dinosaur, a little cast of a Triceratops, and we have display windows where we have uh, some geological artifacts and some uh, astronomical artifacts, and that sort of is part of the thing. So um, let me see, you see you go through the front door. Sorry, this is a little jerky for you guys. It's actually this was done with my, my iPad. So the other day, I'm just kind of moving through. We're inside the lobby now. There's the Marston Exploration Theater. That's where I work, and, and uh, that's where we do some of the program. These are all countdown clocks, and all of them are either counting down or counting up. It represents a whole bunch of missions we got going. I'm going to call your attention to this one in the upper right. See the one that says Luna Map there with a silent H? Uh, T minus 231 days until launch. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to one of the engineers and he's going to tell you they're not launching in 231 days, but we will find out soon enough when they will. You can see some of the artifacts we have on the wall. That's a little scale model of a canyon on Mars. This is a, a mission operations center. And in this particular one, uh, students and researchers are going to be receiving the information coming down from the Perseverance rover. And that one's coming up in about a month. You're going to hear a lot more about it and we'll have programming uh, to show you what's going on. We'll be able to interview some of the students and workers in this room a month from now and talk about what they're doing. Look at that. There's a model of the Apollo uh, uh, rocket. That uh, was the same kind of rocket that, uh, that took our astronauts to the moon in Apollo 14. <clears throat> there is meteorites in our building, some interactive devices. I'm going to show you something over here. This is, oh, upstairs is where we have a meteorite display, big, huge atrium. We've sort of got things going here. Oh, there's a real live meteorite there. And this is actually, uh, we're building a model of another spacecraft. This one, this is life size. So this is a one to one scale model of a spacecraft called Psyche. And we are the principal investigators launching this, or not this model, but a spacecraft like this uh, uh, to go visit an asteroid. Asteroid. I'm going to whipping around here a little bit. Sorry, I'm going to make you dizzy. There's a, a magic planet moon thing. Okay, here's what I'm getting to. The glass you see here uh, is clean rooms. Behind that glass are rooms that are really, really hyper clean. And in these particular rooms, we can actually build space grade equipment. Uh, ASU is only one of about eight universities nationwide that can actually build stuff in our building and then take it up to space. You're about to see a guy come into the view here. Here he is. This is Joe Dubois. Uh, Joe is a lead uh, mechanical engineer on this particular thing. You can see he's suited up. He has to wear all that stuff because he's in a clean room. He's got a little, uh, that's a, a, a static electricity thing. He puts it around his wrist and against the thing so he can actually handle it and not uh, damage it by static shocks. He's going to lift that little thing out of the way. And there it is. Look at that. This is actually a spacecraft being built. It's called Luna H. And uh, this video is just about to come to a close, but Joe's going to be with us in just a second. So he's going to tell us a little bit about what's going on and why the spacecraft is so cool. And uh, so I'm going to kind of uh, close out this movie. I'm going to get Joe to come on to the thing and introduce him. And then we're going to talk a little bit about this particular mission, what it's going to do on the moon uh, in just uh, the coming years. So stop, share. <clears throat> Joe, are you with us? There I'm right here. here. Hi, Joe. Thanks. How are you? I'm great. Thanks, Rick. Um, How come you're not uh, wearing your like bunny suit thing then? So, because oh, I'm oh, you're home. a civilian. <laughs> okay, good. good. Um, so, yeah, we. My wife calls it a lunch lady outfit, and if you, uh, <laughs> okay. that if you think about it, it's it's not too different. Um, now, now it, uh, you call it Luna H, which is kind of interesting because we call it Luna Map, even though oh, the H know, is in there. And I said it wrong. Sorry about that. I know better. As, Go ahead. As we were talking about it, it's because the uh, the the hydrogen is uh, hidden, and uh, the whole the mission is to find water is to find hydrogen, and if the hydrogen's there, we're we're uh, pretty confident the water would be there. Um, it's it's uh it's quite um. It's quite amazing, actually, the way it's done. How do you de detect water by not actually going and sampling it? And we do that by uh, uh, looking for neutrons of a certain variety, uh, uh, temperatures, what they call it. But um, if, if we find these neutrons, we know that the water must be close by. And since this, uh, since this measurement is, is uh, um, it, it's a very, very slight uh, signal. Um, so we have to fly the spacecraft very, very close to the moon and it'll be flying about three miles above the moon uh, at its lowest point. And then it'll swing out uh, to uh, thousands of miles. Excellent. And so um, I sort of, uh, we have that countdown clock, but I think we know, can you explain why we don't really know 
when it's launching or sort of, you know, when we're going to find out when this actually gets to go into space? Well, we're fortunate. We're, we're a very small spacecraft. We're only uh, 30 pounds and it's about the size of a large Costco size uh, cereal box. And we're launching. So we're one of the smallest spacecraft uh, and we're wa- launching on the largest rocket that's that will have ever existed, which is the SLS. Um, the SLS has been um, delayed quite a bit. They've been having uh, a series of issues to, to, to development. Um, and so we don't know exactly when we'll launch, but we're ex- uh, currently scheduled for November, but okay. we're not sure. And, but you're building it now. When does it get to leave the building? What's your target date? We're done, done, um, packaged up and ready to go. Uh, mid-March right now. Oh, wow. They'd okay. like us well, done by March 5th, but we'll be done. Um, We'll be done right around March 5th, mid, maybe the Ides of March. Uh, but then our job isn't done. We still have to, uh, we have mission control to build and we have all the um, uh, operations. Uh, so how we actually drive the spacecraft, we have to develop all that. Because right now we've been developing it in the lab, which is uh, easier, but it'll have to be done uh, uh, in the mission control right there at, in, uh, in the lobby. So the same mission control I just showed everybody. So we're, they're mm-hmm. going to be looking at yep. perseverance images, but they'll also be running the, the Luna map module as well. Right. So if you get a chance to come down and see it, uh, ours, as you look into the fishbowl, ours is on the right. Uh, yep. And there's a, a console, a console being just a computer with two screens, three screens. Uh, and it says Luna map um, in big letters right on top of it. Perfect. We are going to uh, get our audience just really, really ready to come back. I'm afraid we are closed to the public right now just because of the virus. Right, 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 right. But uh, uh, ultimately, uh, you're going to be able to come and see all this stuff. And these people will sort of like be working there sort of on space equipment and managing them and doing that stuff. Okay, so one more question for you, Joe, and then we got to move on. We kind of used up our sure, hour sure. almost. But uh, uh, just going to like tell a little bit more about yourself. And is it exciting to come to work every day and kind of like work on a, something that's going to go into space? And uh, how did it's, you get this job anyway? <laughs> uh, it, it, it is very exciting. It's one of it's actually uh, one of the favorite uh, jobs I've had. Uh, I've been an engineer, aerospace engineer, since 1990 when I graduated uh, from the Ohio State University. Uh, I worked in industry for a long time, and then came to ASU in 2017 uh, f- just for this program. And um, it's it's uh, it's really it's a lot of fun to work on actual science uh, in that these are answering big questions like is, you know, what's the moon made out of? Uh, Could we live there? Um, And, and the professor I work for, uh, Dr. Craig Hardgrove, he's also, uh, he sent things uh, to Mars. He, you know, he worked on programs that uh, investigate other planetary bodies uh, in the solar system. So uh, it, it's, you know, I, yeah, stay in school and get your degree and you can do fun stuff like this. And if you're willing to look like a lunch lady, I guess it's all right. If you're willing to look, well, yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> that sounds good. No, I I think it's great. And I have seen ele- elevated activity. Um, <clears throat> just so the audience knows, uh, we're doing a hybrid classes. So students are kind of coming back a little bit. Some staff are actually engaged. I'm at, at the office, as you just saw, uh, you know, maybe twice a week. So it's not like the place is, is empty completely. But if you think about it, clean rooms are actually not a bad place to work in a, con, in a in, you know, during the virus because they're clean rooms, right? So right. You, yeah. guys, you guys, you one guys, one of the safest well, spots, right? One of the safest spots there is. So a lot of that uh, research uh, that is really critical um, in lots of ways that happens on ASU campus and, been, and has been going on uh, uh, during the virus. So let's get over this virus. Let's get everybody back here uh, in the summer or the fall and uh, we'll start to engage again. But thanks, Joe, very much for, for uh, oh, making thanks, time Rick, to kind of join us. And uh, just another little look at the moon. There's lots going on up there. And uh, ASU has seems to have little fingerprints all over, uh, all over things. So, so we seem to be a go-to place for that. Super cool. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just go back real quickly. We had one more poll. We're probably going to go over our hour just a little bit, but if you guys kind of hang up with us, hang out with us for just a second, um, I'm going to go back to the students so they can launch one more poll. And then I'll give you some updates on kind of some things coming up and we'll be done here in a couple minutes. So how about Actually, poll. Elysium? Actually, Rick, I think we're just going to move straight into close um, with the time. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we don't good. have any Let questions. Me... So we'll just move straight back to you. 
Let me quickly sort of just launch another little screen here because one of the things we try to do is give everybody something to go look at after our program. So we've talked a lot about lunar research and all of that kind of stuff tonight. Uh, we know one of the things we've uh, kind of uh, uh, know from our audience is that they like to sort of like uh, go out and find things. And so it, tonight, it'll be very, very easy to find the moon. It's almost a full moon. It will be full at about 11 o'clock in the morning on uh, Friday. So uh, so it'll be almost round. But, but remember what Nicole was talking about. Remember, you can actually see some of the differences on the moon, the surface texture, especially those colors, especially those deep, uh, darker regions that are the basalts that are we call the mare and uh, i'm going to just invite you to go see that i i did this a while ago kind of we labeled a moon for you so you could see some of that but here you see the mare tranquillitatis uh that's the uh the uh the place where the landing site for 11 and 15 were and then i'm just going to put my cursor over here you can see it so this is sort of the place where apollo 14 landed so tonight if you want after the program just go out and take a look uh, with the rest of us we'll all be doing it up there, seek out some of those darker areas. See if you're going to kind of identify uh, those those pieces, that string of uh, of uh, of uh, seas that go across this way, Mare, uh, Serenitatis, Tranquillitatis, and Fecunditatis. Uh, they're pretty easy to see. They'll be on the top part of the moon for you because the pole will be kind of facing towards our pole. And uh, and check that out. Uh, learn a little bit more about this by looking at Elrock. Download that uh, amazing uh, uh, map program that is uh, has. Been been handed to you. It's in, in your chat. We'll put it in the survey so you can kind of do that and explore the moon on your own. And uh, I think that'll be cool. I do have just a couple of things to announce uh, going forward. And uh, and then we'll be out of here. So I'm going to kind of bring up my dog. You guys ever seen this, this picture before? Those of you that have been around, this is my dog is called Luna. <clears throat> Luna truly does like looking at uh, full moons. And so uh, so that's it. Some things coming up. Uh, we are um, I'm inviting everybody uh, to join uh, uh, another webinar. It's uh, by Interplanetary Initiative, and it is about the Europa mission. Europa is a moon of Jupiter. Uh, Dr. Robert Poplardis will actually be with us. He's the lead investigator, the top scientist on that particular project. And he is actually going to be in a webinar and explain to us uh, what that means. What does the Europa a clipper do what they expect to find and uh, that should be absolutely fascinating it's a it's a mission to go uh, to a moon of jupiter and you'll learn all about it and that is on um, uh, february the 4th and uh, it starts at 6 p.m our time so there will be a link you can go find it and we're going to encourage everybody to do that february 4th six o'clock uh, learn about the europa mission uh, we will be back every two weeks uh, so two weeks from today we were going back to navajo skies we're going to have a dene uh, planetarium show uh, for 35 minutes about uh, native culture and then and then I will be interviewing Nancy Maryboy and Dr. Uh, David Begay and they are Navajo uh, researchers and uh, um, they are both uh, PhDs and doctorates and they study culture and astronomy and culture and especially in indigenous cultures so that's really kind of a great show. Uh, two weeks after that we will be uh, talking about the Perseverance rover uh, the landing on Mars and how that works and what we do and now that it's there what are we going to get from it? And uh, so that would be kind of fun to uh, to do. And two weeks after that, we will be back in the night sky. Uh, all of those bright stars I talked to you about about a month ago, we're going to review them again, but we're going to talk about them from the context of color. And I have a professor that is an astrophysicist that's going to join us. And he's going to tell us what we know about stars from the color of stars. We'll be able to see them in the night sky and then get a little bit of sort of uh, some natural background to that. Two weeks after that is spring. So we just got to winter just this week, right? And uh, spring is here. So we're going to be talking about uh, the equinox and uh, the ramifications of spring and how that works and why it's important, uh, both culturally and how it's going to change our lives. So um, so that's uh, kind of where we're going to go. I want to thank everybody that was involved in the program, especially our guest speakers, uh, the students and Joe Dubois uh, from the Luna Map program. And I want to invite everybody uh, to tell people about this. Uh, join us again and uh, we'll watch for our uh, community communications. And um, if you have anything you want to see, just answer those surveys. Let us know how this is working and what you want to see. Thank you so much tonight. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye-bye.